tell from how we're situated up here that Orion Lewis is the person next to me and is the speaker here. He's visiting us here from Middlebury the last couple days. He's got a student of his with him that's doing some data analysis with our Meta Lab. So it's been a wonderful couple days for both of them to get to know some people on our campus and also for us to get uh, to know them and see how we can continue to collaborate in some different activities. Um, uh, Orion, uh, the other day when we had the time to talk, um, really impressed me as a, a wonderfully active young scholar in the area of not only China and some of its different uh, challenges, but also of looking at how social media can play into the dynamic in today's international relations, specifically in areas where there's either a conflict on, looming on the horizon or uh, in the middle of it and what role it can either play as a positive uh, catalyst to something, or can it actually be or negative, might depend on which side of the conflict you're thinking you're on. Um, and he's going to present some of his data that he's been working on um, that looks at um, how media coverage can actually be um, a pro or, um, not pro or con, but how it can affect um, the uh, different ways in insurgencies can play out. And so I'm going to let Brian take over, and so he'll talk for half hour. Forty-five. Okay. Oh, sorry, and then we'll open it up to some Q and A. Okay. Thanks. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, thank you for hosting me here. I'm very excited to be here, not just because this has allowed me to escape the polar vortex of New England, uh, but because I hold Monterey in very high esteem, and uh, I'm very excited about this research project. Uh, I hope that it will provoke some thinking and some discussion not just amongst academics, but also the policy community. Um, and I hope that uh, we can have a good Q&A and you can give me a lot of feedback, uh, eviscerate my work uh, in a constructive fashion, of course. Uh, and hopefully we can place this article um, in a, a nice publication. And I should note before I begin that, uh, and give credit where credit is due that this is a collaboration with my co-author, Erica Chenoweth who is the director of the Program on Terrorism and Insurgency Research at the University of Denver. Uh, this is a product of a four or five year long research collaboration uh, that we've had, um, and we hope to continue to work with this data to create publications. Uh, but as I'll point out here, this is also a resource that we hope to provide to scholars such as yourselves, the policy community, uh, to conduct research. Um, so the basic, impetus behind this comes from a puzzle. And the puzzle is essentially that intuitively we know media and communications matter for policy and foreign policy. Governments spend a lot of resources trying to craft their media message. Uh, politicians complain when the media does not cover the narratives that they want. Uh, so think of Donald Rumsfeld complaining about media coverage of the war in Iraq. Uh, and so I think policymakers tend to intuitively understand that media matters uh, for foreign policy and international relations. On the flip side, if you look at the academic community, uh, there has been some ideas proposed uh, and uh, ideas rejected regarding the role of the media in conflict and foreign policy. So this comes from a long-standing discomfort I've had uh, with the literature on this. Uh, I went to a graduate school advisor and said I wanted to work on this topic. And he said, you know, the CNN effect idea, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of neat, but academics have looked at this and basically said, you know, media doesn't really matter. Uh, and I found that kind of intuitively uh, unsatisfying. And so what I've done here with this project is try and come back and reevaluate this debate, uh, and hopefully marshaling some new data uh, and providing some new ideas. Before I get into kind of abstract theoretical discussion and empirical discussion, I wanted to start you off by thinking about a critical case of the sort that I'm looking at here, which is the case of Syria. We know that Syria, uh, when the uprising began uh, in 2011, uh, was the Syrian opposition was facing significant repression, uh, particularly uh, the early nonviolent phase of the conflict. Uh, as the conflict transitioned to a violent conflict, 
Uh, we saw increasingly indiscriminate repression on the part of the Assad regime, uh, the use of air power, uh, the use of SCUD missiles, uh, and then more recently we've also seen chemical weapons attacks become more prevalent. Uh, so one of the questions I have, you know, if we think about Syria, this is a conflict that has killed more than 120,000 people. It's created over a million refugees, which if you understand the civil conflict literature, refugees uh, create negative externalities in terms of destabilizing neighboring countries such as Turkey or Jordan or Lebanon. Uh, and so what we've seen is despite this significant toll, uh, the international community, I would argue, has been fairly reticent to intervene in this conflict. Uh, and so one question is why? Why is it only recently that the international community has tried to play a more robust uh, and involved mediating role in this conflict? There's a few strategic arguments. Part of the Obama administration's reticence, or the international community more broadly, uh, relies, uh, might focus on regime strength. The Assad regime is well equipped, has arms from Russia, um, and so it would be a tough task. They also have backing from both Iran and Russia, uh, and so this again helps to prop up the regime uh, and makes it more difficult to overthrow. You also have the fact that the Syrian opposition is particularly fragmented. Uh, and I think organizationally somewhat incoherent, and so you could look at the opposition and say, well, they're fairly weak, uh, <clears throat> and this might diminish your chances of success. And then I think realists would argue that, well, most Western countries would say it's not really in our national interest. This is in the Middle East. If it's not directly impacting our national interest, why should we be involved in this? Now, of course, what I will argue is that national interest is something that is constructed uh, over time, it can be reframed, uh, but most people would say, okay, from an objective distance standpoint, it's not in our interest to intervene. Let me propose a few alternative ideas related to coverage of this conflict. First of all, you could create a narrative that said that, first of all, Western publics were wary of intervention uh, that could possibly prove costly following two long wars. Uh, and we also, I think, particularly at the outset of this conflict, had very little information about what was going on. The Assad regime kicked out all foreign journalists. Uh, they have engaged in a very uh, aggressive propaganda campaign. Uh, and you could argue that this maybe limited our knowledge about what the realities on the ground were. Increasingly, I think, uh, you could argue that Syria has come to occupy a larger space on the public agenda. Uh, this is in part because of the crowded agenda that existed uh, with respect to the Arab Spring and interventions in Libya, uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt. Uh, we're taking up a lot of the air in the room. Uh, we also started to increasingly have better information about what was going on in Syria, particularly once uh, the northern areas of the country were came under rebel control and the border with Turkey uh, opened up and created some additional conduits for better information. This, uh, one could argue, created and started to build a public impetus to do something uh, about what was clearly a significant uh, humanitarian and moral crisis. Uh, and then finally, uh, media coverage and information, particularly about the chemical attacks of August 23rd, uh, provided images and evidence of atrocities that created a political reality for Western governments that perhaps made it more difficult for them to politically ignore uh, the realities on the ground. So you don't have to buy my argument. I put it out there uh, as something to think about. I'll come back to this at the end of the talk. So the general questions that I'm trying to get at here, first of all, are uh, does international media coverage of conflict play a significant role in shaping foreign policy decisions and particularly decisions about intervention? And then empirically, we want to evaluate what are the uh, empirical relationships that we find between international media coverage, intervention, and conflict resolution. And I'll point out that in this case, 
I'm not interested in all types of conflict resolution in terms of just ending a conflict through either negotiated settlement uh, or a settlement that allows the regime to stay in power, but I'm interested in the type of case such as Syria where uh, we would ideally want to see the opposition uh, emerge uh, victorious. My argument, briefly, I mean, media coverage, obviously, you understand my biases at this point uh, and my basic view, but media coverage does shape the foreign policy process. It helps to explain third-party calculations, even when we control for all of the other factors that might drive third-party calculations about intervention. Um, increased traditional media coverage uh, is associated with greater likelihood of international intervention, uh, as well as greater likelihood of opposition success. And finally, I'll present some preliminary ideas related to social media and new media, uh, which I think hopefully might challenge some conventional wisdom about the importance of these sources of information uh, for the success of these insurgencies. Uh, and uh, basically, I'll argue that new media uh, does not significantly impact a greater likelihood of intervention or success. So a few literature foundations. First of all, this is rooted in what we would call second image arguments of international relations, arguments that link domestic factors to international behavior. So the role of public opinion uh, in foreign policy, uh, the construction of public opinion, um, and how that might influence the way a state behaves internationally. There's also a literature on the CNN effect, which looks at satellite television and real-time uh, communications and argues that this has facilitated pressure to intervene in places such as the Kurdish region of Iraq in the early 90s, in Somalia, in Kosovo, etc. And then, more recently, we have this discourse on Twitter revolution, Facebook revolution, or whatever you want to call it, uh, that argues that part of what was driving these successful campaigns in the Arab Spring was social media, and this somehow was a game changer. Some of you may know the CNN effect, uh, but a very stylized account, a narrative that's probably almost certainly false, was that Barbara Bush was in the White House uh, watching CNN one day and it saw pictures of starving Somali kids. This created uh, a great deal of consternation on her part. She lobbied George uh, to intervene uh, on a humanitarian mission in Somalia. Uh, and this resulted in the ill-fated uh, Black Hawk Down incident in which a number of American servicemen uh, were killed. This is obviously somewhat a stylized uh, account, but it speaks to what we would call an agenda setting model that media essentially shapes public opinion, and that public opinion then feeds back and pressures states uh, to act internationally in ways that they might have done had there not been that public pressure. Now, you can look at this and say, well, okay, that might make sense in some cases, but this is also leaving something out. Uh, and there have been a number of critiques almost immediately after this idea came out. There were a variety of critiques of this literature. Uh, a number of realist critiques that would say, no, these interventions did not occur because of media coverage or because of public opinion, but it was really about traditional calculations of national interests. Uh, that policymakers had decided that this was in our national interest and had already decided to do something, and that once they did so, the media coverage subsequently followed. This is also supported by reappraisals of causation. Was it media that caused intervention or the decisions that caused greater media coverage? In fact, some people have gone back and looked at cases like Somalia and said that it was actually the opposite, that these decisions had already been made prior uh, to some of the media coverage. So this speaks to an alternative model, which argues that it's not really about the media as an independent actor, but that states and politicians matter that they have resources, they have better information than anybody else, and they use the bully pulpit to essentially shape public narratives. Uh, and they shape media narratives, and that then subsequently feeds down and shapes public opinion. 
Uh, so you have these kinds of contradictory models of how we might think about the interactions between these different actors. This debate is also, I think, reflected to a certain extent in the foreign policy community. So former Secretary of State James Baker argues in Iraq, Bosnia, Somalia, Rwanda, and Chechnya, the real-time coverage of conflict by the electronic media has served to create a powerful new imperative uh, to prompt action that was not present in less frenetic times. Fairly strong statement on the importance of communications. Second statement by Colin Powell, which I find to be a bit more contradictory. Live television coverage doesn't change the policy, but it creates the policy, the environment in which policy is made. So on one hand, he seems to be saying that it matters in shaping policy, uh, but it also doesn't matter in shaping policy. So I find this to be uh, somewhat of an ambiguous and contradictory middle ground. And then finally, the third quote, uh, I guess rightly, <laughs> appropriately cited to an anonymous individual, to hell with public opinion, we should lead, not follow. Uh, and so I think this debate is pervasive throughout uh, academia, and you see some contrasting opinions here in the policy community. A few previous findings that I was standing on with this paper, I think there has been uh, research, very credible research, that argues that public opinion does in fact matter for foreign policy. Traditionally, in the 50s and 60s, international relations theorists argued that public opinion uh, was really something that drove states away from a rational calculation of their national interests. That publics were fickle, they didn't have a lot of information about foreign affairs, and to the extent that they were involved at all, uh, it was only to cause the process to go in an irrational direction. Increasingly, what research has found is that publics do hold stable views on foreign policy, uh, that they update those views based on new information, and that at times they do hold politicians accountable uh, for those views. Other research has found that public opinion is an important constraint on the timing and duration of intervention strategies. A complementary set of research says that media matters. Uh, the most, uh, I think, explicit formulation is the CNN effect saying that media has driven a new era of humanitarian intervention. But more nuanced views say that, well, uh, international media, uh, co media coverage of international events uh, can in fact shape the timing and the duration of intervention strategies. This uh, work by uh, Wilnev uh, researcher Pat Reagan, uh, and Baum and Potter have found that public opinion and media, media shapes public opinion and political support for presidents during times of crises. So what do we make of these contrasting views? I think the work of Baum and Potter has provided an interesting synthesis on this approach by looking at media as part of a market. Uh, they respond both to the demand for information from publics as well as the supply of information from leaders. And they point out uh, this model of, that focuses on the elasticity of reality, uh, which I think is actually a fairly nice way of thinking about this. That when conflicts first begin, leaders have much better information about what's going on, publics do not, and so there's a significant elasticity of reality. Leaders have a flexibility to reframe and reshape public narratives in ways that suit their interests. As time goes on, however, information becomes more prevalent, publics become more informed, and the gap between leaders and publics shrinks, so there is increasingly less elasticity, right? less space for leaders uh, to uh, reshape the narratives of reality. So my research design in looking at this is I do a two-stage uh, set of models. Uh, this is not exactly a, uh, what we call a two-stage model, but I, I look at this in two iterations. The first is I want to model uh, what shapes international intervention. And the second stage, I want to model the likelihood of opposition, of a conflict resolving in favor of the opposition. Uh, given intervention and 
other variety of hosts of factors that uh, we think might matter here. Uh, the data that I'm using, as I mentioned, is part of the Program on Terrorism and Insurgency Research, a uh, long-running uh, data collection effort uh, called the NAVCO Data Project. And this data is uh, NAVCO 2.0. Um, the unit of analysis here focuses on campaigns, and we focus on campaigns rather than conflicts per se, because what is unique about this data is that we have created a research design that tries to systematically evaluate both major nonviolent civil resistance uprisings as well as traditional violent conflicts. Uh, and I think we are unique in trying to integrate these two things within the same research design. Traditionally, civil resistance resides in comparative politics, contentious politics. Uh, civil conflict is more of the security uh, bombs and guns folks. Um, and we're trying to say that we can, in fact, think about a range of tactical choice across major uprisings. So our unit of analysis is annual campaign years. Uh, and our inclusion criteria is every major campaign, both violent and nonviolent, that has maximalist goals of either overthrowing the regime, uh, achieving secession, or engaging in anti-occupation. Uh, and this, I can talk more about the data, I'm not going to go into too much, but if you have questions, I'm happy to address them. Uh, we look at only those campaigns that are, have these maximalist goals, because we're not interested in small-scale social mobilization, uh, you know, random protests. We're interested in organized, purposive, iterated campaigns that have a clear organization uh, and engage in a clear strategy of nonviolent civil resistance. So for example, in Libya, when the Libyan uprising started, when you had spontaneous uprisings here and there, uh, we would not call that a major nonviolent rebellion because of a lack of organization and a lack of kind of clear uh, iterated structural coherence to that campaign. Uh, this data is available um, via a special data feature that we published last year, and I point this out not just for my own self-promotion, but because part of our educational mission here is that we want to provide open sources of data uh, to facilitate scholarship amongst academia as well as the policy community uh, and so we have made this data publicly available uh, to folks like yourselves. And if you're interested, uh, you can find it at this URL. Uh, if, you not, if you Google NAVCO Data Project, you'll find the whole page where we have the data set, uh, code book, um, uh, and replication data for, for our article here. Um, so stage one. What I did, uh, and I should point this out that I'm interested in intervention short of military intervention, and I think much of the debate about the CNN effect has looked primarily at whether media coverage causes states to intervene militarily. And I would argue that that's an extremely high threshold uh, to think about the role of media, that if you think about military intervention, those are the very high cost forms of intervention that are more likely to uh, conform to a more traditional strategic calculus. Uh, about the costs versus the potential benefits. Uh, but the literature on intervention points out there's actually a wide range of intervention strategies and that uh, states have a, a wide choice here. And so what I did is I constructed uh, three threshold measures using variables from our data set. Low threshold intervention would be uh, simply diplomatic condemnation of the target regime, uh, international NGO support, uh, diaspora support, very basic things that uh, might come into play when uh, other third party actors are trying to uh, support an opposition campaign, uh, but also a relatively low cost. Moderate intervention uh, is developed here based on material repercussions, uh, so whether resources and support are withdrawn from the regime, whether or not they are given uh, to the campaign. Um, and in particular, whether uh, major powers withdraw their diplomatic support uh, from a regime. So a good example here is Iran. When there was a major uprising in Iran in 1979, the withdrawal of U.S. support from the Shah, I think, was very proximate to the fall of the Shah. 
Uh, and so we could have some kind of anecdotal evidence that kind of the strategic uh, support or withdrawal of support can matter significantly uh, to the viability of these regimes. You can also think about, say, Obama administration withdrawing support from Egypt during the Egyptian uprising. Uh, and then the high threshold here, again, high threshold short of military intervention would be direct sanctions placed on the regime. Test variables that I'm looking at, international media coverage, a simple ordinal variable that looks at the uh, degree and frequency of media coverage of these conflicts, ranging from almost non-existent to very minimal to moderate coverage uh, occurring a few times a month. Uh, to high coverage occurring on a weekly basis. I'll also test the role of new media. We uh, coded a variable uh, that looks at whether or not an opposition campaign constructs what we would call parallel institutions. Simply, do they have an organized online media strategy uh, to promote and mobilize uh, their campaign? few controls. Uh, I'll just go through these quickly for the sake of time. Uh, we want to control for tactical choice, which has previously been found to be important. Uh, whether or not the campaign is cohesive or whether there is conflict within the campaign itself in terms of opposition actors uh, disagreeing and having a certain degree of infighting. Uh, we want to think about humanitarian concern, uh, so we look at the degree of repression. Uh, to what extent is uh, repression um, not more about threats versus material sanctions versus actually going out and killing folks? Uh, the uh, literature also argues that intervention uh, is fundamentally based on relative power and the likelihood of success. So Bueno de Mesquita has argued that intervention will occur uh, when the likelihood of rapid success uh, is high uh, and where the likelihood of success is low, uh, we will, we're less likely to see intervention. So I have a few variables here about the, the uh, military expenditures uh, by the regime, um, how many military personnel they have, and the size of the opposition campaign, which I proxy as a measure for the strength of the insurgency. And then finally, there's some arguments about the type of conflict might matter. Uh, ethnic secession conflicts, uh, Reagan argues, are more likely uh, to be easily resolved. Uh, I don't know if you buy that, but I test for it. Uh, so here are a few models, and I'm not going to go through the minutiae here, uh, but I'll point out a few things. What I'm using here is a uh, Cost duration model that is clustered based on the uh, campaign. And so the coefficients here are hazard ratios. So a coefficient above one means that an increase in that variable uh, makes it significantly more likely that you will see the dependent variable of interest here, which in this case is low threshold uh, intervention. A coefficient of less than one uh, means that there is actually a reduced likelihood that that event will occur. So, for example, here, this repression coefficient, even though it's not significant, would indicate, well, there's a less likelihood of low threshold intervention. So we can talk about this uh, in more detail later, but what I'll point out here is what I've highlighted in terms of our international media variable being uh, positively and significantly associated with the likelihood of low threshold intervention. Uh, I also have this broken down between violent conflicts and nonviolent conflicts based off of uh, what you may be interested in. Uh, interestingly, uh, repression uh, is significantly associated with an increased likelihood of intervention in a nonviolent context, uh, but perhaps not so much in a violent context. If we look at moderate threshold of intervention, a similar pattern emerges. Again, uh, international media attention positively and significantly associated with greater likelihood of moderate intervention. Uh, and then finally, on high threshold intervention as well. So uh, 
the bottom line here, I think there are some other very interesting findings that I'm not going to touch on in too much detail. Uh, but the bottom line in terms of the uh, things that I'm interested in is that international media coverage seems to be robust and positively associated with intervention at all levels. Uh, <clears throat> if we look at the likelihood of successful resolution uh, in favor of the opposition, uh, some interesting patterns emerge as well. And I can talk a little bit about the methodology here uh, if you want, but this is a uh, competing risks model uh, that looks at the likelihood of successful resolution of a campaign in favor of the opposition relative to alternative outcomes, which would be a campaign ending with major concessions short of victory relative to the end of the campaign uh, resulting in the failure uh, for the opposition. And again, you see this positive uh, relationship between international media coverage uh, and a greater likelihood of opposition success, even after we control for our intervention variables. Uh, and so I think this presents some interesting questions. Why do we see this? What might explain this? My argument is that increased attention internationally of a conflict, uh, even if it's not precipitating intervention, or even if intervention is already occurring, might represent a threat of greater action on the part of the international community, uh, that there is a threat of uh, reduced international support or sanctions or uh, increased arms going to the uh, rebels. And so uh, this also might explain why we have this uh, relationship. Interestingly, there's also uh, significant support for some of our alternative strategic arguments, that if a regime has significant third-party backing, and they continue to have third-party backing, the likelihood of success for the opposition goes down dramatically. Uh, also, the third thing I would point out here is related to duration. If you go back to the argument we made uh, regarding Ball and Potter's view that it's actually uh, time that matters significantly here in terms of uh, more time might lead to more foreign policy actions on the part of the international community. Time also seems to matter here as well. Uh, so here's perhaps a more intuitive way of looking at this in terms of levels of media coverage. Uh, and this is the cumulative incidence function which is essentially the probability of successful resolution. And what you see here is that uh, high media coverage is associated with a much higher likelihood of successful resolution for the opposition. Now you can also look that we're talking about, uh, it doesn't change the game. You know, we're talking about 20, 30% likelihoods. Uh, but it is significant and you can clearly see the differences between levels of media coverage. Now, an alternative view, uh, which some of you may be interested in, is what about this new media? Isn't this a game changer as well? Uh, what's going on? And what we see, and uh, I should point out here that our sample of campaigns that have created these institutions of new media outreach is quite limited. So I would hesitate to draw any significant conclusions from this. But in the evidence that we do have, I was, in fact, very surprised to find out that, well, it's significant, uh, but perhaps not in the direction that you would expect. Uh, and what this is essentially saying is that if you have these institutions of new media, uh, your likelihood of uh, success is actually much less. Um, and so I think that poses some interesting questions as to why might this be the case. I don't know if I have a great answer for you, uh, but I could put forward a couple of ideas. I think first of all, when we talk about the role of new media in these conflicts, we should think about it as a tool for social mobilization, uh, that it helps to target and expand mobilization and support of the opposition. Uh, but it may not be a game changer in terms of broader public opinion, that traditional media is about broadcasting and new media is about narrowcasting. Uh, and so while this might be important for expanding opportunity for mobilization, 
uh, it may not be a game changer in terms of the broader dynamics uh, of these conflicts. Uh, there are some, you know, to the extent that new media uh, helps to expand mobilization, it may be working through what's being captured by the size of the campaign. If it uh, expands mobilization, uh, you may see some positive relationship there. Uh, <clears throat> so I think this presents some interesting uh, initial findings. Again, I would say very preliminary, uh, but here's a more intuitive look here right at the uh, cumulative incidence function. Uh, those campaigns that do not have new media uh, institutions uh, actually have a higher likelihood of success. Here we're talking about an even lower probabilities, uh, so the impact is not extremely significant, um, <clears throat> irrespective of whether or not you do or do not have. So I think in order to understand this, I'll be quite honest with you, I probably need to go into the data and look at these conflicts in, in closer detail uh, from perhaps more of a qualitative standpoint. So let me return to my case of Syria. What does this mean for Syria? To what extent does this empirical uh, information help or not help explain what's going on? And I've already pointed out that I think some of the strategic variables and arguments that I've mentioned in terms of regime support or regime strength uh, do in fact matter. Uh, another finding that I didn't discuss was that uh, the more a country spends in terms of military expenditures, uh, there is some uh, reduced likelihood of international intervention and reduced likelihood of opposition success. So there is some uh, empirical support supporting those strategic arguments here. I'm not saying that they don't matter. Uh, but what I am saying is that media coverage matters as well. Uh, and so if we think about the case of Syria, uh, as I mentioned, I think the international community was very reticent to intervene uh, for many of the reasons I already mentioned. Uh, I think the Assad regime was very uh, aggressive at trying to control the media narrative to the extent that they had people going around and switching off the TV televisions and cafes away from Al Jazeera uh, to the extent that they uh, engaged in their own uh, television programming to present their view of the conflict uh, and engaging um, in propaganda. And so much of our information, at least in the early phases, was based off of reliance of new media, this kind of trickle of information that comes out of conflicts such as Syria or Libya, uh, where Gaddafi also cracked down on the media quite heavily, or think of Iran during the Green Revolution. As time went on, though, uh, you saw this growing pressure to intervene. Perhaps there was uh, increasing coverage, as I mentioned, rebel advances helped open up new channels. Perhaps the agenda became less crowded. Perhaps there was growing humanitarian concern. Uh, and as time goes on, you see increased intervention. So we know that the Obama administration secretly started training Syrian rebels in Jordan uh, during this time. The information came out later. Uh, but you see this kind of gradual buildup. What's interesting here uh, is I think what we see in 2013 is increasing intervention due to the shifting reality, understanding of the realities on the ground. So following chemical attacks uh, earlier in 2013, uh, the Obama administration decides to start arming uh, reliable uh, rebel groups, if we know what reliable rebel groups are. Uh, and then, uh, more importantly, in August of 2013, you have a major chemical attack uh, that provokes strong international backlash. And this was, I don't know if you remember, uh, but that period in which all options were on the table. And suddenly military intervention or significant intervention looked like a real possibility. Uh, and this is, I think, the uh, approximate cause uh, to the concessions that the Assad regime made to actually come to the negotiating table, give up its chemical weapons, give up their chemical weapons. Uh, what happened? Uh, and so I have an interesting uh, quote. I actually talked with uh, CNS's own Amy uh, Smithson when she came to Middlebury, and I was asking her about this. We knew that there had been chemical attacks in Syria prior to um, August 21st, 
Uh, there had already been findings that chemical weapons had been used. So what changed? And I think she had something interesting to say about this, which was that the quality of the images from that attack uh, were of significantly higher quality and had a much bigger impact uh, than previous attacks. So she spoke of videos of uh, children that had limbs and eyes twitching in different ways that would have been impossible to fake. I thought it was interesting that when she gave her own forensic analysis of the chemical attacks of uh, August 21st, that she was using media images herself. She wakes up in the morning, goes and starts looking at the video. She create, runs her own diagnostics based purely on those images that were coming out uh, from this attack. Uh, so I think here, you know, I, I don't know how compelling you find this argument, but here you have, I think, a fairly persuasive argument that images and information about what was going on here mattered for public perceptions, and they mattered for shifting public perceptions in a way uh, that were more supportive of increased uh, intervention. Policy implications. Uh, I don't want to just engage in an abstract academic exercise. Uh, I'm sure you guys can uh, come up with much more robust policy implications than I can. Uh, but there's a few things, right? First of all, CNN may be too important to leave up to CNN. Uh, <laughs> what do I mean by that? Well, uh, I think what, what this says is uh, we need to try and think about what the communications environment is surrounding our understanding of these conflicts um, and what should or should not be done about them. Uh, if you think about CNN as a market-driven enterprise, if you're pained by the views of uh, you know, reputable journalists cutting away from uh, serious stories to cover Justin Bieber's escapades, um, you know, maybe we need to think about what our media institutions look like and have a better understanding of what they choose to cover, what they don't cover, and how we as policy practitioners can help shape the information and coverage ourselves. The communication environment matters. Uh, secondly, and again I don't uh, support this necessarily uh, in a strong way, but I think it also speaks to some skepticism about the importance of social media and new media as some kind of fundamentally game-changing institution. Do I think these things matter? Absolutely. I think it's hard to argue that they don't, uh, but it may not matter in the way that we think they do in terms of being the determining uh, causes of success or failure. So a good example of this comes from the Egyptian Revolution. We saw in that revolution that Mubarak shut down the internet for a period of days. Uh, and what happened? The mobilization continued. And it continued because the campaign was well organized, uh, because they had their own methods. They had been trained in civil resistance. And so the argument is it was the organization of the campaign uh, and it was the connections between grassroots actors that mattered much more than their ability to tweet out information uh, to international observers. Right. Uh, if you think about things such as the Syrian Electronic Army, or say what Iran or even China does with social media, there's also a line of analysis here that says that, well, in some ways this makes it easier for regimes. Uh, that they can use online sources of information to identify who potential opposition actors are, uh, and that they use that as open source intelligence to go out and then target and uh, sometimes even attack or kill those actors. Um, so social media is a tool, it's a powerful tool, uh, but it can be used by both opposition actors and regime actors, and I think we need to understand what those dynamics are. Uh, uh, and then finally, I, I think a basic line of analysis here is that indiscriminate repression, whether it occurs in a violent context in Syria uh, or in a nonviolent context, uh, matters a great deal. Repression in a nonviolent context is one of the most robust predictors of international intervention. Uh, but uh, I think some of these uh, examples from Syria and elsewhere also indicate that 
uh, images of this type of repression, kind of indiscriminate uh, humanitarian uh, crimes, uh, might also matter for shaping international perceptions of those conflicts. Uh, so if a regime represses in the woods and there's no one there to see it, uh, is it repression? Uh, do we understand it as repression? Um, you know, I think shedding light on this uh, and to the extent that media is doing that uh, is particularly important. Uh, so I, I'll stop there and uh, I'm happy to uh, take any of your questions or discussion. Yes, sir. Uh, one thing that you, know, you mentioned the shutting down of media. Have you studied what impact that has in terms of? Because especially in the West, we value free press and free access to information. Um, so have you studied what impact you know, the shutting down of, of either new media or social or even digital media has on public opinion in terms of yeah, I mean, to studying it, I would say, to the extent I've studied it, it's a corollary, corollary to what I'm saying here, right? Which is, those campaigns that have less media attention um, are less likely to get support, less likely to be successful. So I think that argument would basically be the converse uh, of what I'm arguing here. Um, <clears throat> so that would be my basic argument. I think there's also a number of anecdotal uh, examples, if you think about, I would argue that the cases of shutting down the media are the ones I mentioned. I think Libya and Syria uh, were the, the big examples of the Arab Spring. Um, but, you know, you also have Ben Ali in Tunisia, uh, Mubarak in Egypt also trying to do something similar. Um, it was less effective in the nonviolent context. I think it was at least somewhat effective in Libya and Syria, at least for some period of time. I can tell you that we have our uh, ongoing data collection project. Our next data set is looking at daily event data, so daily actions by various actors within every uh, country that was impacted by the Arab Spring. And what we saw is we're coding data, coding data, and then uh, Gaddafi shuts down, you know, kicks out the international press. And most of our data is based off of open sources. And so, what we found is, well, suddenly <laughs> it became very hard for us to code data about what was going on in these countries uh, during that period of time. Uh, so I know I can say from my own personal experience, um, you know, the amount of information dried up considerably. Um, and so I think that raises a lot of questions about, um, you know, how we can build public knowledge about these things if, if we don't know ourselves. Right. Yes, ma'am. Um, I want to ask you about the impact of uh, negative media in relation to um, social uprisings. I guess I'm thinking of the case of um, Occupy Wall Street that happened a number of years ago, and it received a lot of, in my opinion, neg negative media attention. How did that factor into everything you've talked about? Yeah, um, I think it's a good question, and um, you know, it's something that I'm not really able to get at here in a really a uh, good way, to be perfectly honest, but um, I think there have been, um, you know, studies done to try and look at the balance that is placed on media stories, and I think I've also done that kind of research as well. It's very time intensive and difficult, and <laughs> has a whole set of methodological issues. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think to the extent that there is negative media coverage of, say, civil resistance campaigns or social mobilization campaigns, it's obviously going to constrain their opportunity for expanding their, their base of support. Uh, and I think this makes intuitive sense. If you think about you know, what these campaigns do, their whole goal is to publicize and communicate a message, particularly if it's of the nonviolent variety. Right? The reason nonviolent movements are successful is because they are able to mobilize people in a achieve a level of participation um, that violent campaigns simply cannot. Violent campaigns, uh, you know, there's only so many people that want to pick up a gun and go shoot people and have the ability to do that. Nonviolent campaigns can mobilize women, old people, everybody. And so their success, I believe, hinges upon uh, their ability to have people participate. And in order to do that, you need to have information about what they're doing. But they also have to be able to communicate a message, uh, and a message of nonviolence, moderation, 
of the sorts of messages that will uh, get people on board. Yes, sir. Well, her question raises a larger issue. It seems to me that your argument is based primarily on the fact of the on the extent of media coverage. In other words, the more the media coverage is of particular conflicts, the more likely you seem to be suggesting that intervention might result in some way. But I mean, isn't isn't the actual content of the media coverage vitally important in these contexts? I mean, if if the media is covering various conflicts and if they're presenting very biased coverage, which in fact they have in almost all these cases, in my opinion, then obviously that, that it should be the, the quality of the media or the, or the content of the media should be obviously an important variable, not just the, the amount of media coverage. Would you agree? No, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, and I think, you know, my response here is what I'm really looking at is the agenda setting function of the media. So the view here is, are the issues on the agenda or not? Um, and you know, one of the things that we know from political communication is that the content and framing of media messages do matter. Uh, but the media effects are not simply a unilateral effect. That those things are moderated through the individuals that receive those messages. So if you're more well-educated, if you engage in uh, debate with your colleagues here or with others, the impact of media in terms of shaping your views is actually much less. It's really media matters for shaping the views of uneducated people sitting at home by themselves, right? For the most part, I mean, that's a bit of a hyperbole, but, uh, you know, so I think one, and I'm sure you probably don't find this entirely convincing, but I, I think one thing that I would argue is that to the extent that these issues are on the agenda, that is significant, uh, but it doesn't determine public opinion. Um, and even if media coverage is biased, uh, it's not necessarily going to shape, say, elite public opinion that really matters for policy making. Right? It matters for kind of broader public support. Um, and so I don't, uh, you know, I, I think you're right that the content here is important. Um, but it's not determinative. Um, but the biases of the media oftentimes reflect the biases of the governments in these cases. I mean, for example, there's always more of a focus. You, know, you think about the intervention in, in the Balkans in the mid 1990s, where you think about these recent, you know, what I regard as catastrophic interventions in Libya and places like that. I mean, in those cases, the, the uh, regimes were essentially. Uh, there's much more attention paid, paid, paid to the authoritarianism of certain regimes and the crimes of certain regimes, and the, and the, and the opposition in many cases were, were whitewashed and so forth and so on. That's an ongoing thing. And for example, if you look at the situation in the Balkans, I mean, it was the, 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 the Bosnians and the Croatians were also engaged in ethnic cleansing. It wasn't just the Serbs, it was all three groups were engaged in ethnic cleansing. But the media coverage talked almost entirely about the Serbs. And, you know, they were better at it because they were, they were more militarily powerful, but the fact is that all different, all the parties in that conflict were engaged in that defense. If you read the, the media and the way the government was portraying it, you'd think that the Serbs were the only people who were, who were villains. You know, and you'd think, for example, the Syrian conflict, the, the focus on the atrocities of the regime and the complete ignoring of the atrocities of Sunni jihadist groups, I mean, these things are, are, are very biased and they affect whether people think uh, we should support the opposition or not, or not support the yeah, no, and I, I, I don't disagree with you, and I think in, in many respects, you know, part of what I'm looking at here is um, primarily intervention on the part of third-party actors in favor of maybe what we view as, um, you know, just opposition campaigns against more authoritarian or despotic regimes, particularly in the nonviolent context. Um, and so a few things I would point out. Intervention is less likely to occur in more democratic contexts. So for government is relatively more democratic, that is more uh, aligned with the values and beliefs of the majority of the international community, it's less likely to intervene. Uh, if uh, a country is richer, uh, they're also less likely to intervene. Um, and so I think some of these biases do show up in the data here. Um, I don't disagree with you, actually, to be honest. My goal here is to have a first cut 
at looking at, at this uh, from kind of an agenda setting standpoint. Uh, but my goal is to provoke exactly this kind of discussion and hopefully additional research. So I myself have a lot of ideas about uh, ways to take additional steps here. Uh, I think we need to look at uh, who these actors are, who's supporting who, uh, who's withdrawing, you know, so I think we need a much more nuanced analysis of who, who's supporting either the regime or the opposition. I think for that, I'm going to have to get into the data in a lot more detail than I'm able to do here. Um, I think you're absolutely right that we need to look at, um, you know, the, the, the valence that's placed on media stories, who, who they're supporting or who they're not. Um, again, that's from a purely practical standpoint, um, is much harder to do quantitatively. And so I think this has to come in more kind of a comparative case study, qualitative type of approach. Um, so that's, I'm sure that's unsatisfactory, but um, that's all I can say at this point. Yes, sir. Sure. Um, so looking at your data, you've seen any indicators of the role that internal media can play in starting these conflicts? Just thinking anecdotally, like I think about um, uh, radio mill screens in uh, Rwanda being kind of instrumental to the genocide and then kind of the way Milosevic used Serbian TV to inspire uh, followers and bring yeah, So, so um, again, I haven't looked at it, you know, our primary concern here, because we're really interested, primary goal of this research is to evaluate, you know, what is it that makes civil resistance campaigns efficacious, mm. right? So that's our bias here is really on focusing on the opposition and what their tactical choices are. And so we have some data about, say, for example, um, whether or not they spend significant resources in media outreach. Um, you know, so if you think about, you know, the Cuban Revolution starting up their own radio station or something like that, right? Um, and one of the, I didn't present these numbers, but I did look at them, and one of the things I found is that those campaigns that you know, have this kind of PR campaign going on are more likely to receive international media coverage. Um, and so I, I don't know if that might also speak to um, what you were discussing, um, but you know, the tactics of the campaign matter uh, here. Um, <clears throat> this is also supported by work by John Robb, who wrote a a book called Marketing Rebellion, if you're interested in this, and he looks at a couple campaigns, um, does kind of a comparative case study, and he finds that campaigns like the Zapatistas in Mexico, why were they so successful? Well, they were much better at marketing themselves to the international community uh, than other campaigns, right? East Timor is another good example of that, right? So I think there's some, some research and some findings that um, provide some support at the, from the perspective of the opposition campaign. One of the things, you know, I, my background is on uh, media in China, uh, and so I'm very well aware of how authoritarian regimes <laughs> uh, manipulate media and information. Um, and so, you know, I, I teach about this and we, we talk about this in class, you know, how does, say, um, the Iranian regime uh, try and frame uh, the Green Movement. Uh, and there's some great propaganda videos, if you're interested, Iranian propaganda videos, where there's John McCain, George Soros, uh, and, and you, know, you know, a few other people sitting around the table, like, debating about how they're going to create peaceful evolution in Iran. Um, and John McCain is presented as you know, part of the White House for some reason, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I guess he's scarier looking. <laughs> um, and, you know, but basically I, I think what we know from studying these campaigns is that the traditional authoritarian playbook on this sort of thing is to frame particularly nonviolent actors as tools of the West. Um, and I think this speaks to a very interesting question about, you know, should the international community get involved in these things at all? If you intervene on behalf of a nonviolent uprising, does it delegitimize them? Does it play into the narratives that the regime has? Um, and so, you know, if you think about Obama sitting on the sidelines of the Green Revolution, you know, maybe that was a good strategy. If you intervene, 
uh, doesn't it just play into the narratives and delegitimize and, and reduce their ability to garner broader support within their own domestic context? Um, and so I think much of these things um, really kind of hinges on that. Think about um, uh, another good example is the Tibetan uprising of 2008, um, where it was, you know, repressed. I would say not as violently or as significantly as it was in 1989. Uh, but if you look at what happened there, the Chinese government really lost the international uh, marketing or the international discourse on what was going on there. There's a natural bias to view Tibetans as peaceful, uh, and the government is this repressive regime. And so we had all these YouTubes coming out, uh, and you know, even though some of them were factually inaccurate. <laughs> Uh, coming from Nepal or elsewhere, you know, there was this real narrative of Chinese repression. Um, and so what they have done is, first of all, they um, were very effective at shaping the debate within China, that this was not about Tibetans opposing uh, you know, infringement on their culture or institutions, but that this was about the West trying to split China and break it apart. Um, and so what you saw in terms of domestic public opinion was that there was actually a backlash against the Tibetans and against this whole action that most Han Chinese actually ended up, you know, engaging in very vociferous nationalism in support of the government because they were able to use nationalism, they were able to use the kind of, um, you know, neo-colonial type of argument um, and, and shape these events in a way that um, I think actually didn't really hurt them very much domestically. Uh, hurt them internationally, but for the people that counted, it didn't. Um, so I, I think these things are these are fascinating questions about how governments are doing this. But I think one thing you have to realize is that with you know greater media, even new media or information, uh, regimes are having to become more savvy about how they do these things. And so I have argued that um, you know the kind of traditional propaganda. Uh, is no longer effective, right? That they, they're competing uh, sources of information and narratives, and so regimes have to become more savvy uh, about how they present themselves. And in fact, you see governments doing this. The Chinese government is a great example. They go out, they've been studying uh, Western PR tactics, uh, media management, spin, all of these sorts of things, this is now how they're trying to reformulate. They don't just control the public discourse. And so what they're doing is they're trying to, you know, utilize the tools and leverage that they have to reshape that discourse um, in ways that they find favorable. Um, and so they've even done things, they've taken plays out of, say, Rupert Murdoch's playbook, uh, where Fox News tries to delegitimize the New York Times. Well, the Chinese do that. They use Xinhua News Agency to delegitimize the more open and liberal newspapers. Um, and this has come directly from their study of Western media management tactics. Okay. Thank you very much. That was very important. Uh, I uh, think we all learned something about uh, what the data is beginning to show you, but also all the questions it's opening up. Yes. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming on a Friday. <laughs>